All right. Like I said, you guys, this is going to be recorded. And one thing I usually say at the beginning of these webinars is please go back and watch this video again as soon as you get the opportunity to look at it. Um, the reason why is because it really makes it stick in. Uh, if you watch it again in two or three weeks, it's just not going to have the staying power in your brain, I guess, uh, if you watch it too far down the road. So make sure you look back at this and um, review it again rather quickly because it'll make it uh, so you learn it rather than memorize it. Memorizing just has a tendency to last for a day or two, whereas when you learn it, you will learn it for a, a much longer period of time. So this is going to be on how to protect your portfolio in a market sell-off. Now, the reason why we started this series is because the NYSE is getting rid of stop orders. And because they've gotten rid of stop orders, some people that aren't in the markets on a daily basis uh, have lost a tool that they would use to make sure that they could uh, keep a hold of some of their gains. Well, the reason why the NYSE has gotten rid of this because the about 60% of the book has left the business. Uh, that's because people are online and, and doing things that way. There's no uh, broker that holds a book of business to show all his limit orders or to have all of his limit orders. So uh, in a sense, when the market gets a little bit wanky, uh, there's a bit of a vacuum there. So if you have stops in there, it's really uh, painful where those stops end up getting filled, um, especially because a lot of the algos will race They'll see the orders come in and they race to uh, get their orders filled and they're faster than us. They have much faster uh, computers. So this is a way to protect against that. It also helps. It's going to help you sleep better night. P puts perform better than stops do. Uh, it allows you time to think about it, to uh, let the market meld a little bit, if you will. And it doesn't always force you out. So with the stop, you might get forced out. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, here it comes back. And you're running to get back in. This will allow you to uh, to hold on to these positions longer. And today, we're going to be building on the collar. So we started out with puts. Then we added uh, a call to the strategy. Today, we're going to be defining that call risk. So uh, you can participate still on the upside in case there's a large move. So going on, moving on, my name's Eric Wilkinson. Some of you may recognize me from CNBC, Fox Business, or even the Wall Street Journal, where I've commented on everything from economic to geopolitical and market analysis. Please keep in mind that everything that we talk about in these webinars is not a solicitation to buy or sell any of these securities or strategies. At the end of the day, we're here to teach you how to swim. We're not here to swim for you. And the reason why we can't give you that advice is because we don't know your risk parameters and I don't know what's in your portfolio. So what I'm doing may not necessarily work for you. I'm also here to teach you how to take control of your finances, manage your own portfolio, and most importantly, teach you to how to manage your own risk. At the end of the day, you guys will save a lot more money by doing this yourself, even though you have to sometimes lose money to learn. It's like the cost of tuition. Uh, once you've gotten a grasp of this, it, it's not that difficult. And if you're paying somebody else to do it for you, that money is just flying out the door. At least this way, if you're losing a little bit of money, you're paying yourself to learn. Uh, and I've traded in most markets throughout my career from the Chicago Board of Trade. I've traded everything from stocks, financial futures, commodities, currencies, and options on all of those products in all market conditions. As you can see down here, that was a crazy day. Uh, Got to go over this little disclaimer before we go on. I mentioned parts of it in, in uh, previous slides, but this is basically saying any opinions, news, research, analysis, or other information contained here is not to be considered uh, a solicitation. It is only to be considered general com or general commentary. Uh, and like I said, it is not a solicitation to buy or sell any of these securities or strategies. 
But one caveat to that, I do have positions on and I probably will be talking about some of the positions that I have on or, you know, talking about some stocks, I should say, in which I have positions in. And I'm not trying to get you to buy or sell any of those. Just trying to get you guys to learn to take control of this yourself. So, uh, you know, full disclaimer there. And the bottom line is, uh, please do your own homework and remember past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. Um, I'm going to have to figure out how to turn back on my questions box because I accidentally X'd it out. So I may have to do it some other way. All right. So like I said, this is going to be how to protect your portfolio uh, using options. And we're going to build upon what we used before, uh, which was the collar. So it, we started out, like I said, buying the put, then selling the call. Now what we're going to try to do is we're going to be adding in a long call to define our risk to the upside so that we can participate on, say, uh, some unforeseen event where um, maybe Lululemon gets bought out by Under Armour. We didn't really see it coming. We've been long Lululemon and we've ridden it down a little bit too far maybe. Uh, now we're looking, okay, if it goes much lower, I'm going to look to get out of this stock. That's where our put comes in. And then because it's been in a range and I'm going to go to the platform here in a little bit. If it gets to a certain point, you know, maybe my break even or something along those lines, I'm going to look to exit this this stock. So that's where we sell the call. Uh, that's kind of like our limit order. And then what happens if it does get bought out by uh, Under Armour? Well, that stock could really pop a lot higher. Well, in that case, maybe I do want to have this stock and be able to participate on those extra five, 10 uh, handles higher. So that's where that call spread is going to come in. And we're going to try to do this all for a, uh, a scratch and a scratch means, you know, we're going to have to pay for the put and then we're going to have to sell a call spread and try and finance that put. All right. So, um, let me see if I can. All right. So like I said, here we are, we're going to be Long the underlying, this is something that we've had on for a while. Then we're going to buy an out of the money put, so below the market. And then we're going to sell an out of the money call spread, meaning we're going to sell an out of the money call. And then we're going to buy a further out of the money call spread. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can. Oh, just. Let me see. Oh, there we go. All right. Got the questions box back. So uh, let me see. <laughs> All right. So, yes, yeah, so I'll tell you guys how I uh, became known as the Wolfman towards the end of the uh, uh, thing here. So, uh, okay, so I'm also being, are these stop losses or buy stops? These are, okay, the puts are stop losses. So, uh, and it, it is also considered a stop. A stop loss uh, is the same thing as a stop. It's just shortened through years and years of, you know, the people talking about it, they stopped saying stop loss and they just went to stops. So the puts are to act as your synthetic stop. And the reason why, if you had a stop on uh, in the market and say, for instance, I bought XYZ stock at 50, right? Um, now we're up around uh, 80 in this stock. So if I wanted to capture those gains and limit my losses, which is where the stop loss comes in. You're limiting your losses uh, and it's below where you're trading. If I bought a 75 put, then if the market goes down below 
75 and it say goes to 70. When you're buying options, it gives you the right, but not the obligation to uh, execute that options contract and executing an options contract means I would force the counterparty to buy my stock at that strike. Okay. So in a sense, if it goes from 80 to 70 and I had on the 75 strike, I could force that counterparty, whoever was the other side of that trade to buy my XYZ stock at 70. So it's a losing proposition for the, the option seller in that, that case uh, and a winning proposition for the person that owned that stock. Um, so it's not a buy stop in a sense. So we're long the stock. We don't really, uh, we're not looking to buy any more of these. A buy stop would be something that was um, above the market usually. And, uh, and you know, if you were using technical analysis, analysis, it would trigger that. So a buy stop would be closer to a call if you were buying a call. Okay. Does that make sense, Mr. Uh, good one? Good one. Godwin, sorry. Um, so that's the difference there. So we are talking about a stop loss in the put side. Then the call is going to act as your limit order. So when you put, when you buy a stock, sometimes you might say, Hey, uh, I, I want to sell X, Y, Z stock when it gets to hundred. So that's where you would sell your call is at 100. And, um, you know, what if XYZ gets bought out by uh, ABC? Now that could double the value of that stock. We saw that in GMCR, you know, it went from like uh, 20 or 30 or something and went to 85. So um, that's where something like this is going to be very beneficial where GMCR just looked like it was just never gonna stop going down. Well, uh, lo and behold, somebody comes out and uh, wants to buy that stock take it or buy that company and take it private. Well, they decided they were going to pay 80 some dollars a contract. Well, that was a huge windfall for a lot of people. But if you had on just the sell call to finance that put, well, all of a sudden you sold out at maybe $50 and lost the $35 to the upside. This is where this selling the call spread will allow you to participate on the upside. Does that make sense for everybody? Uh, Bud, you're asking, can I use this to protect options? Yeah, if you were long a call, for instance, say for instance, a leap or something like that, absolutely. And, and I'm a person that likes to use the leaps on the, uh, rather than for the stock because uh, your margin requirements are much less and your risk is a lot less as well. All right, good. All right, so moving on. So picking the right strikes. Now, the reason why you wanna pick the right strikes is because I don't wanna pay a lot for all of this protection. Just like with a, a limit order and a stop order, you don't have to pay to place those in. And that's kind of the idea behind this is we're gonna try and do this so we don't really have to lay out any money. Um, we're gonna actually try to collect a bit of a credit here so that we can lower our basis. And when I say lowering your basis, that means if I paid uh, $50 for XYZ stock again, and uh, I did this for a credit, then doing this as a credit lowers that basis. So if I did this strategy for 10 cent credit, then that means synthetically I paid uh, $49 and 90 cents for the strategy so or for the underlying and if you continue to do this you can lower your cost basis to almost zero which you know i've actually done in the past where i've uh, well over half the cost of the initial stock that i purchased back in the day i don't use buy stocks as much as i used to but i used to always buy the stocks and then just sell calls against them all right so uh let's move on then picking the right duration now with this one Usually I say we're gonna go into this real 45 day area because this is where you get a lot of theta decay. And I'm an option seller uh, 
because I like to see this come out. I want to sell the premium and I want to see it all come out really quickly. Uh, we're going to be picking somewhere between this 84, 85 day. And you can do it in here because uh, we're the way we're building the strategy. We don't uh, we don't really care um, as much as just when you're selling premium because because we're buying these puts, uh, we want to have a little bit of duration before all that premium comes out. But at the end of the day, if you're collecting a bit of a credit, then uh, it, it is not as uh, as important, I guess I should say, as when you're just doing the selling strategies, which is what I usually talk about. So um, this isn't necessarily as important as all of them, but I still like to go somewhere between the you know 70, 80 days just to let it ride out. Um, I don't like to pick it way in here because then your commissions and everything else um, can really counteract everything. And you're not going to get as much of premiums for these in here usually. And picking the right environment. Now, we don't want to do this with all of our stocks with this strategy where we are doing the call spread. Uh, you know, it does limit our upside potential sometimes, but this is going to be something where we're worried about the downside risk on this particular underlying. But, you know, given that it, we've had a bit of trouble with this stock, you know, that it could be an environment where, you know, we see that spike up in the uh, underlying, like we saw with GMCR. And picking the right underlying. Now, this is one of the most important things, and I'm going to go into a little bit later how to pick different underlyings possibly because uh, everybody has different stocks in their portfolio. Some people have, you know, J&J uh, &J and McDonald's and, you know, a lot of the big names, but some people have uh, crazy stocks in there that, that not a lot of people are participating in, even like uh, – DuPont or uh, Dow Chemical, you know, those are big names that people have in their portfolios, but people aren't trading those in the options that much. So there's a wide bid ask spread. And when you get that wide bid ask spread, you really get eaten up on getting in and out of these strategies because uh, there is not a lot of participation in there. And you have to give up the edge to get in and you have to give up the edge to get out. And when you're giving up edge, that is giving up profits. So just think of it that way. You want to have a tight bid ask. And I'll show you in the option series a little bit later uh, how I determine that and how to find a surrogate, uh, a, a surrogate uh, stock uh, to take advantage of the same kind of situation. Because we don't, you know, if we have Dow in there and DuPont, we might try and find something else that there's a lot more participation in. It's not necessarily going to stop you out, but you will be able to collect credits for it. If it goes down too low, then you can get out of the puts, let's say, and make a profit there, sell out your own stock, and synthetically you've gotten out at the prices that you wanted. Does that make sense to everybody how to use a surrogate in a sense? All right. So this is a collar, but it's a little bit of a twist on this. A lot of people don't talk about this. This is something that I use when I think that there might be a buyout because this stock is really getting beat up. And I'm, you know, it's kind of like uh, I got the thumb screws on me where uh, I think that the stock, you know, could continue to slide, but I don't want to, I don't want it anymore if it does. Uh, and if it gets too low, like, you know, with, Maybe, for instance, Lululemon, it's gotten beat up over the last year or so. I mean, Lululemon at one point in time was going to buy Under Armour. And, and now it looks like Under Armour is going to buy Lululemon. So, uh, you know, times change. So uh, that would be something where it would be where, you know what, I may be wanting to get out of this or Twitter. I may be wanting to get out of this because they haven't found a CEO. Uh, and I'm going to really, uh, it's going to take off if they get a good CEO for one or somebody decides, hey, you know what, Let, let's scoop these guys up. All right. So the max profit on this is unlimited. 
Now it's unlimited in the sense that a stock can go, you know, to infinity. Okay, that's not necessarily going to happen with any stock, uh, except for maybe Amazon or Google. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so your your profit side is unlimited, and it's minus the width of the spread though on the call side. So you know, if we have a five dollar call spread, keep in mind that once we go past our long call. So if again, in XYZ stock, we have, we're short the 50 calls and then we're long the 55 calls. We are going to lose that $5 if it goes to 75, right? But we're participating from 55 to 75. So we've lost that in between the tweener, but once you get that huge jump, you're allowed to participate as soon as you get above 55. You're participating again at 56, 57, 58, 59, as soon as it keeps going higher. And that call spread uh, offsets each other and you're out. But say, for instance, um, you know, it goes to 54. You know, we are looking at it like, OK, well, we got out at at, uh, at 50. I can't remember if I said 55. 50, 55, yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're selling it out at 50. So that's some of the risk you're taking with this on the upside. Then on the, and then I have here, so uh, it's the underlying short call strike minus the underlying plus the premium. Now, remember, you got to add or subtract in your commissions. You got to subtract your commissions. You're going to add the premium in for a credit or you're going to subtract it for a debit. So remember, if you did it for a debit, you pay it out. So it's a negative. So plus a negative and plus a positive. So think about the premium. You have to say a debit is a negative because you paid out on that. All right. And the reason why you have to add your premium in is because, you know, you're lowering your base. So you have to that adds to your profit. All right. And then your max loss uh, is limited to where your long put is, because remember, we can ultimately say, all right, you need to buy the or the counterparty. You have to buy my stock at the strike price. So your max loss is the underlying price minus the strike price minus the premium. And the reason why you subtract the premium here is because remember, uh, I'm looking at this like we're going to at least try to get a, a credit. So if you're getting a credit, you're lowering your basis, which means, you know, instead of your underlying price being 50, it is now really 49.90. OK, so that's why this premium is subtracted. And again, uh, if you did a debit or did this as a small debit, say, uh, of 10 cents, you paid 10 cents to put this strategy on it's minus a minus which means it's a positive right Does that makes sense to everybody may have should have put parentheses here uh, but just keep in mind credit is positive because you're taking it in a debit is negative because you're paying it out so you have to you have to mind your positive and negatives all right good all right, and your break even is your underlying price plus your premium or your underlying price minus your premium, depending on whether or not you did it as a debit or a credit. And keep in mind that you have to consider your commissions as with anything. All right, so let's get into the platform. Enough with the boring slides. So into the platform. So actually have Twitter up here already. Um, so first off, like I was talking about with the finding uh, surrogate, if you will. Now you can do the correlation studies over here uh, and find it out. You can go into the gearbox and say, you know what, I need to find something that's correlated to. So you click on the gearbox. The correlation study is uh, you can add it, but I need to find the correlation study so you put it there and then if I want to change the um, 
Uh, wait. Oh, so I need to go down here, I think. How do I do? I've forgotten how to do this because I haven't done it in so long. I haven't changed it. But you can switch the... There's a way. I guess I should have... Maybe it's this. Okay, there we go. So you click on that little down box there. So correlation study with, I have it as the NASDAQ, the QQQs. Um, but you can change this. You can go in there and change that to whatever stock it is that uh, you want to find the, the surrogate for. And put in like Dow or whatever and then hit enter. Okay. And over here on the side, it will populate different things that are correlated to that. So that we would want as close to a one-to-one -one relationship on something. So uh, it could be, you know, very closely correlated to the, the spoos or the, uh, the DIAs, the diamonds. Uh, so you could, you could do it as one of those. Now keep in mind if it's a, a $50 stock that you're dealing with and your surrogate is a hundred dollar stock, you're going to want it to do um, a little bit less. So, uh, you know, if you had a thousand shares of Dow or something like that, you would probably only do 500 or uh, five contracts of the options. Because remember, one options contract is equal to 100 shares of the underlying. So and I always look to under hedge in that situation or in any situation, especially when I own more than 100 shares or so. All right. So. Um, so anyway, so that's the way to find the surrogate. Find something that is traded a lot and has a lot tighter bid ask. As you can see, Twitter has a lot of participation in there. It's three cents wide. You know, obviously it's only a twenty-two dollar stock, but um, you know, you could look at like Dow Chemical that I was talking about before, and uh, you know, it being a fifty dollar stock, you can see it starts getting a little bit wider in here. And DuPont being the same thing. The reason why I brought these up is because both of these stocks are uh, looking to merge. So, uh, and DuPont is, you know, even worse. So DuPont and Dow might even be a close. They're probably running in tandem uh, every day on on a percentage move basis. So, say for instance, you had DuPont in your portfolio. I'm sure that the Dow is very closely correlated to it. Um, I usually have a, um, a chart that I can do uh, correlation studies on also. So we could do it like this and look at Dow here and then you go into the gearbox and oh, maybe it's not the gearbox. The line here and then the gearbox so comparison lines against the cues and you can change it here as well and do it against DuPont hit OK I OK so as you can see these two stocks are very closely correlated and the more that they've been talking about merging it's even more and more correlated of course sometimes it's going to have a little bit of movement for the most part they run pretty close to in tandem so that's how another way you can find the surrogate for that. So I would have to say, you know, this is probably more of a um, 70 or 80 percent correlation just because in the past, before they started talking about merging, it wasn't as closely correlated as now. But so you can find correlations that way. And that's just um, with the, uh, the studies. And sorry, it's on here. So I just did the, the price correlation comparison study from finding it over here and cleared out everything else. And that's how you get the correlation study. And it defaults to SPY, I think. Okay. So another way to find your correlations. There's also a website, and I, I gave it to one of my other classes on a different webinar when we were doing uh, doing it with that. I can't remember what it is offhand. Uh, so anyway, let's move on to uh, say, for instance, like if we're looking at this, so 
GMCR I brought up a couple of times. I don't know if you guys know the story of uh, Keurig, but Keurig has been getting decimated. If you look at it like on just this year, uh, for the most part, I mean, it's just gotten crushed. Um, the soda pop machine, I guess, isn't working out very well for it. But anyway, so as you can see uh, right here, they were at their lows. So this might be where you were like, OK, you know, if it goes any lower, if it goes below this area here, I am out of this. I've ridden it too long or whatever, or maybe, um, you know, somewhere in here where it's just starting to trend sideways. It's not doing anything. You pick your place. All right. This is where I'm pulling the ripcord on this stock. It is a bloodbath. But, you know, it's been beaten up so bad. I mean, you know, they have the infrastructure and everything else. This is probably below book value at this point where if they just sold off all their assets, they probably had enough to uh, even pay out some of the shareholders on the common stock, um, which is my guess why they this company ended up paying you know, $85 or whatever it was, $89 is because that was probably close to the book value, maybe a little bit of premium on it. Um, and that's why it popped up so much. But, you know, knowing that and knowing uh, that it's worth more than where it's trading for the most part, you might say, hey, you know, this guy is a buyout opportunity, you know, and this is a resistance right here at 60. You can see it kind of bumped up a couple of times or even 70 where it found support one time. But that might be where you're like, okay, if it goes below $40, I'm out. Um, and if it goes below above 60 something, you know, 60, you know, I'll, I'll sell out also, I'll, I'll take my lumps, but let's say it goes above 70, you know, you know, no, no telling where it might go then. And maybe it's on, it, it's figured itself out, you know, you want to participate on that upside. So that's where this strategy is key is something like that or, you know, uh, if we look at um, Twitter is a very similar situation where, you know, I think Twitter has a lot of potential. Uh, they have, uh, they have a, a lot of money still, but, you know, you can tell they're at historical lows on the week chart, but, and come off of something serious. They haven't found a CEO to run the company after they booted out the last guy, uh, the, the guy, the founder, but, they've just kind of lost their way. Now, what happens if they come out with a, and find a really great CEO? This stock could jump 10, $15 overnight. So if this is something that's in your portfolio, you might be thinking, all right, well, if this goes on much longer. I don't want to be in it. I don't want to ride it into the ground. So I'd be out, you know, below $20, but I want to be back in this above maybe $30 or something like that. Cause it could easily kind of trend back up. But I want to be in this if they come up with a brilliant way to monetize or if they come up with a great CEO. So and with these stocks, these type of stocks that can happen rather quickly. So I would hate to limit my upside to, you know, five dollars when it could really overnight trade 15, 20 dollars higher, especially if somebody big comes in to buy them out. Does that make sense to everybody there? Where, where I'm getting with this whole idea of we want to the thought process behind this. So, you know, every strategy doesn't fit every underline, you know, or every thought process that you're going through. That's why I'm, I'm trying to teach everybody all of these different strategies is because every stock to me, you know, I look at every stock differently and it, uh, I want to have a strategy in there. It's kind of like in golf, you know, um, everybody probably relate to golf some way or another, but so you got the green down there 150 yards away and you're stuck behind a tree. Now you can either go under the tree, you can go over the tree or you can try and go through the tree, right? Those are basically your three options. Uh, none of them very good because the one where you got to go under the tree, you're probably using a really, long club to keep it low, but you're going to probably overshoot the green at 150 yards. But now your club that you got to go over the tree, you know, might be the one that's just short of the green. And, you know, you can even throw well that maybe there's water in there or something like that. So 
you have to have the different tools in your bag to to attack each situation differently and then try and come up with the best way to <laughs> or you can use a cannon to go through the green that's right <laughs> That's that's usually what I do, <laughs> or the uh, the famous foot wedge to get it away from the tree. Um, so all right, so that's the different ideas behind this. So um, to approach it, so something like I'm trying to give you situations where you know a buyout is really where I would try and use this. It's not always going to be. Um, you know, this is something where it really pops. I want to participate in it, but if it just continues to go here, uh, I want to uh, maybe get out of it if I have the opportunity, but I also really want to protect myself on the downside. That's what we're really trying to accomplish here. So, um, and you guys can throw me out suggestions also on different stocks. Uh, I'd love to see what you guys are looking at, what kind of things you guys have in your portfolio. So feel free to hit me up in the questions box as to uh, what you guys may be looking at um, and see if this would if this would be something I would put uh, around one of these stocks. Now, I can't tell you this is what I think you should do, again, because that goes back to risk parameters and knowing what's in your portfolios and uh, you know, the SEC doesn't allow us to give investment advice, no matter what kind of um, what kind of uh, securities licenses I have. Unless I sit down and like look at your portfolio and go over it with you, I would never be able to give you any kind of investment advice. Number liquidators. I haven't looked at them in a long time since they got spanked because it looks like they're not doing too bad, but. I'm sure that whole thing about them uh, using propylene, what was it, polypropylene or something like that was leaking out and causing it to turn into something crazy. But, uh, you know, they they just fell like a rock. Um, so uh, lumber liquidators, this would be definitely something that, you know, they could easily get bought out. And plus, you know, this company is a good company. It was just some... I think it was in China or something that, that it was the Chinese manufacturer that was doing something wanky and I'm sure they've cleared that up. So this would be something that um, somebody could be, you know, buy them out. Like why wouldn't maybe somebody big like Menards or I don't know how much Menards, how much money Menards has. But so this is where the rub comes for me with lumber liquidators, because look at how wide this is. It's 65 cents wide. So, um, and you know, it is aftermarket uh, on a slow uh, week, you know, holiday week or whatever. Um, but, you know, for a $17 stock and giving up, you know, 60 some odd cents, I would have to try and find something to, to be a surrogate, forget that, because it would be really hard to get in there. Um, unless I could do this all for, for zero money and you just put it in there and hope that you get hit. Oh, formaldehyde. That's what it was from their China sourced wood products. That's right. It was formaldehyde. Um, and it, when it got hot or something like that, it, it leached out in the air. Right. Um, but I'm sure, like I said, they've, they probably didn't even know that was being done. Uh, it's probably a way for the Chinese manufacturer to uh, cut costs or something like that. I mean, we hear about that stuff all the time. But for them to really get crushed that bad, I mean, I'm still seeing commercials for them. So they, they can't be doing too bad. They're probably buying as much stock back as they can. But, you know, again, this could be a stock that it really pops up. So that might be a time where I kind of looked at something else that was really correlated to it and uh, and try and catch that. But on the other hand, if this is something you wanted to do, I would, you know, I usually go to about the 20 uh, some odd delta. It's I don't like the 30s and I don't like really the 15s because you don't get any credit for them uh, on the upside. So I would probably look at, you know, buying 
the 14s and I would look to, uh, you know, so if I'm going mid market on this, I wouldn't even want to really do that. I'd probably try and do this where I'm selling these for a dollar. And I don't know if it's going to let me do it because I'm a, uh, oops. So let's just do this. So I'm thinking I'm going to do that for a dollar. I did those for 90 cents. So maybe I'd be doing it for, ugh. so I got, I'd probably need to do it for more than that. Even, uh, the 20 ones, at least a dollar. Maybe I'd try and do these for, let's say we're doing this for 75 cents. So I pay 75 cents. I'd sell these for a dollar. So I got a quarter to play with, um, and maybe try and get these for a quarter. So, uh, hit the control and then it's saying I'm doing it for a debit. I'd probably look to try and get it up to getting 10, 15 cents and see if somebody hit me. All right. So to do something like that on something really wide, you know, make them come to you. Make, and I wouldn't start out there. I'd probably start out at something like, you know, 35, 40 cents because everybody else that may be in there might be willing to give up that edge to you, you know, and play that. So that's the other way to do it is start out real wide, but don't go, don't go negative on that one. All right. So then your $4, you wouldn't participate on the upside from 21 to 25, but say it goes to 35, 40, you're participating again on those. All right. And then you're out below $14. But the beauty with the put side on this is, um, and I did that um, on the 58 days. So within 58 days, uh, you know, you have that to play with. So let's say, you know, the day after you put this trade on, it drops down to 10. You don't have to get out. You can wait to the last day. You can wait 58 more days for that trade to work because, You've got those put, you've locked in your price. Now with a stop, you said it's, you got down and boom, you're stopped out. But now all of a sudden it pops back up here and then the news comes out and it rallies, which is always what seems to happen, right? When you get stopped out this regard, it goes down. It has time to work out because you've got time on your side with those puts. You can either, you can either put it to the other guy or you can, uh, wait it out and see what happens. The other thing you can do is you could, you know, it gets down to 10 or five or whatever. And you're like $5, uh, you know, I'll write it out for $5. You cover those puts and collect the premium for the puts. Cause now the premium, those puts has gone really up and you've still held on to the stock. Okay. So you can play around with this strategy and get it in and out of it. Cause you bought those puts, you know, you can, sell those puts out for a higher premium if it goes way down and you don't have to put that to the other person at $5. Cause you know, at $5, you might be like, you know what, for the next $5, I'll risk it. You know, I've got nothing to lose at this point. Okay. So uh UPTN do one more. Wait, UPTN or, Oh, sorry. N N P T N. All right. So it's another like $10 stock. So this is a good example of where I would want to, you know, put this in because you got tweezer tops here, um, which means, you know, it's come up tested that obviously that is a uh, area that some big money comes in to sell it. So, um, you know, that's right above $11. So if I own this stock, I might say, Hey, you know what, I'm going to sell this stock at $11. But again, if it gets bought out, I want to participate on the upside. Uh, and if it goes much below this $9, that would be where I'd want to get out of this stock. I don't want to ride it into the ground. Again, I think this is going to have really wide bid ask. That's actually pretty tight for, uh, well, it's 15 cents for a $10 stock is pretty wide. You would hope that it would be a little bit tighter because, you know, if you look at something like, uh, Chesapeake, it's going to have, you know, 
it's 10 cents wide, it's seven cents, but it's after the market. Usually that's about five, six cents wide. Uh, Hertz is probably a little bit tighter just to give you a comparable. Um, it's about 15 cents wide for that one too, but that's after the market. But uh, that would be the way I would uh, attack that. Um, but saying it might be better to uh, do a leap to protect it. Yeah, you can. You got to, and you've got to uh, play that out. The reason why I don't really like this uh, strategy with the um, the leaps is just because you know, in general, markets do go way up over time, and I'm always worried about my calls uh, on that. Um, so, but you can, you can definitely do the leaps because at the end of the day, you're just, you're trying to do it for, and you're, uh, trying to do it for a, uh, no money out, outlay. So, you know, for the puts you could do, um, let's go back to Twitter just because it gives us a lot more strikes probably. But I usually go at about the 50 to 80 some odd days. That's just my preference. Um, but you could definitely go to the leaps, for instance, and do, say, in Twitter, if it goes below 15 or $20. And you're also going to pay more for these options out here, generally speaking. So you're going to have to go a little bit tighter uh, in order to do this for uh zero down, I guess, if you will, or, or a credit. So keep that in mind. So you end up having to come in um, a little bit. So, you know, I might go to the 13s. If Twitter goes below, let's say 15, goes below 15. Um, we would buy that out here. Um, and this is your own preference. But see, I usually like to go a little bit tighter and not tie it up for that long. And then I would have to go up here and figure out how I can get a dollar fifty-seven. So um, you know, I did the sixteen deltas there. So I'm going to go up and out probably right around. Uh, sell this for right around there. So we're selling the thirty-five strike, and just hold down your control button to do that, and then. Uh, I've got to uh, pay less than 19 cents. So, you know, you're going to, this is the risk that you're going to involve yourself with the further out you go. Is, uh, now you're taking on a lot of risk in between. You see what I'm saying, bud? So, I mean, if you wanted to pay a debit for having that, that distance, you know, you could do it for, uh, you know, a 45 cent debit. So, um, and then only have $10, $10 of risk. So that's, that's the risk reward for going further out. Cause they, the, the premiums are just pumped into those, you know, they're, they're adding in the volatility and everything else. So that's why I usually like to get in a little bit tighter so I don't have to pay a debit for it. Um, but you, you know, you're, you're buying yourself a lot of time. You're buying yourself a year right to be right uh and you know in a year's time twitter could easily go to uh 45 but again you could also you know you're 35 40 um there's a lot of things that can go on in there and i don't know i just i i just prefer the the 60 to 80 even the 80 days so be pretty hard pressed to go above 45, I think, in the next year, but that'd be, you know, 100% increase. So I don't know if that would work for me. But, you know, I'd play around with it and always look at that too, because it's not the end of all be all. You know, it, it could easily uh, behoove you and you might be able to do it for uh, a, uh, a credit, but usually not. The, and the other reason why that's getting pumped up you know if this was uh the current iv percent was around you know 10 15 something like that uh 
that might work a little bit better because it's right there at 50. There's a lot of volatility pumped into these right now. And a lot of that volatility comes from the fact that, uh, you know, there's a lot of unknown with Twitter right now. So I would, with Twitter, I, I would probably look at something like, you know, at, at 19, if it goes below 19 or 20, uh, you know, I might want to be out of this. If it goes below this 20 area, um, I would probably really be thinking I need to get out of it. Uh, I wouldn't want to ride it anymore. But if it goes above, let's say, this area of resistance, I want to start looking to be able to participate in that a little bit. So that's the way I would look at this is, you know, it's obviously found a lot of sellers. People want to get out of Twitter at 30. But what happens when it goes above that? These shorts in this market are going to run to get out. So you might see a serious pop in this. So I would look at this Twitter trade uh, to try and get this done quickly because we're running out of time. Sorry, you guys. Um, so I look at like the 19s. Because uh, it's right there around that 20 delta. That's usually what I, I shoot for. Somewhere right between, the, give or take, the 20 delta to the 15 delta or the 25 delta. So it's kind of a pick them there. Um, so I'm just going to try the 19s right now and then we can adjust it from there. But that's where I usually go for is the 20 delta on that. And then, um, like I said, I want to be participating above 30. So here's my 30 strike. So I could probably sell the 25s. I'm going to collect $1.55. So now my credit's $1.85, or sorry, 85 cents. So I have 85 cents to spend, right? To put this strategy on. So you can look at it like I can buy the 28s, you know, 29s, the 30s. I would. I try to spend all my credit on this and just do it as a um, small credit there, maybe pay for my commissions or whatever. And that's how I would, that's how I approach that. I figure out where my pain threshold is, where I want to be out of this. And that's where I start, you know, because my idea on this is it's going to go down. This is a stock that I'm worried about. And, and you know, your biggest challenge on any, uh, even stock for finding a, a stop is where do you find that? St the first thing that goes through your mind is where would I put my stop? And that's kind of where I do this. And keep in mind, you know, Twitter can go down to 10 and the next 50, 60, or we're in the 80 days. So the next 80 days and come back and I don't have to put it to them. But if it does go down to 10, I, I can sleep at night knowing I'm out at 19 and again you can if it goes down to 10 and you can say you know what I've ridden it down I've collected ten dollars worth uh, you know I lowered my basis by ten dollars because if it's gone down ten dollars you're collecting ten dollars of extra premium in here because this is going to go up by that ten dollars you can buy those uh, puts back in or sorry, you can sell those puts back out at a higher price and that lowers your overall basis. Does that make sense? Um, I, uh, Gordon's asking, do I mean to do uh, February put? Uh, either one would work on this. I kind of played around with both of them. Oh, yes, I did. I went to the March automatically. I did mean to do that, yes. Sorry about that. So I can just change this to Feb. Or March. Oh, so it's going to screw up all my pricing. So five cent debit. So I'd probably need to change my 28s to the 29s. Bummer. Oh, well. So, yeah. Thank you very much for catching that, Gordon. I did mean to do that all in the same month. And you do it. I, I play around with it till I can get myself a credit. But I do go through those steps where I find the put first. Uh, where's my pain threshold, then go to the calls. You know, I look at the charts also um, and figure out where I want to continue to participate in this if it happens. Uh, but I would be willing to get out if it doesn't. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? 
So that's why I picked the 25. You know, I, I'd be looking at Twitter. You know what? I want to be out of this. It's not going anywhere. If it goes too low, I want to be out. If it goes to 25, I'd be happy to get out. But, you know, the back of my mind saying, well, what if Twitter gets bought out and it goes to 45? Then I don't want to cap my upside on this. So I want to be able to participate from 29 on up. Now, of course, you're going to lose that 400 in between, uh, but that's that's the risk you're going to uh, pay in this one. You're going to have to you're going to lose that gap of that spread. So if it goes to you know uh, 31, then you know you've lost out on that four. But if it's at 31, you've gained uh, eight and a half, right? So you've gained eight and a half dollars if it goes to 31, but you lost four. So you, you still gain 400, 400, uh, 800 of the underlying because you own a hundred shares is where I'm assuming. So if it goes from 22 to 31, you get eight and a half uh, dollars times your hundred shares of your underlying that you made on the upside, but you've lost 400 on this part of the strategy. So you have to subtract that from your winnings. So you've made 400 in a sense on the upside total. Does that make sense, you guys? It's a little bit different than the calls because or just the calls because then I'd be out at 25 and there's no no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You're out at 25 for the most part. Unless you covered the, the calls and thought that there might be a little more upside to it. But at the end of the day, you're, you're pretty much out at 25. Right, so that's how I approach these. That's about all I got. Does anybody have any other questions real quick? I hope that wasn't too confusing that I accidentally skipped into the wrong month on that. All right, looks like everybody's pretty clear on it. All right, somebody asked me about how I got my nickname, the Wolfman. Um, I don't know if you guys watch any of my market daily market commentaries for one I rarely shave uh, was the big thing. And uh, on the floor, there wasn't like a hair thing. So that's just something that I always procrastinate is going to get my hair cut. I don't know why. Uh, so um, I used to stand next to Rick Santilli and, you know, he would come to me on uh, what probabilities of Fed moves were and, you know, just economic things and bouncing things back and forth. So way back in the day, Joe Kernan, um, picked the, started that name. Hey, Rick, what's that guy's name right next to you? Wolfman or something like that? Tell Wolfman, you know, what does Wolfman think about whatever? And that's kind of how I got my uh, nickname was from Joe Kernan because he could never remember my my uh, my real name, I guess. Uh, and a fun fact about Joe Kernan is he and I share the same birthday, so. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, so Joe Kernan was the one that coined Wolfman for me. So, uh, and um, it just kind of stuck after that. So there you have it, Joe Kernan. He used to always call my clerk uh, Biker Boy also because <laughs> he had long black hair and uh, looked like a biker, like a Harley rider or something like that. So he was Biker Boy and I was... Uh, uh, he called me the Wolfman, but that's how that's how it ended up. Hey, Rick, ask Wolfman what he thinks about whatever. And then, of course, uh, then Steve Leisman used to do it also. So, um, if I had a hundred shares of Twitter, when you only do one combo instead of ten, ah, uh, yes, great. You know that auto defaulted. Absolutely, do it for as many as you have on this one. Sorry. I wasn't paying attention to that. So yes, you would absolutely do only one contract for every 100 shares. Of, and the other thing is, is you can do this if you had a thousand shares of Twitter, let's say, you might only do uh, maybe seven or eight. You know, I always look like to under hedge these kind of positions. Um, any position for that matter. Anytime I'm doing this kind of strategy, 
from doing the puts, um, I like to under hedge it. Never over hedge it for sure, because you're creating a lot more risk, especially when you uh, don't have the the call, for instance. So um, if you didn't have this long call in there and you were doing two or three of them or something like that, you know, um, then that would, sorry, I'm messing this all up. You know, you wouldn't want to uh, sell more calls than you had of your underlying. You wouldn't want to do it something like this to get a nice credit for it because your risk above 25 is, you know, you're short that stock at 25. That means somebody else is coming to you and handing you their stock. Does that make sense? So, yeah, one share for because each option contract is 100 of the underlying. So it's 100 share. It represents 100 shares of Twitter. So if I have 1,000 shares of Twitter, I might do eight contracts, something along those lines. I don't always hedge all of them. Does Joe wear a rug? I don't know if Joe wears a rug, but Rick wears cowboy boots every day. And uh, Rick is a uh, car enthusiast. So if you ever get broken down, uh, Rick's the guy to fix your car, believe it or not. So uh, as a matter of fact, I think he was even talking to him one time. He was going to uh, convert a couple of his cars to natural gas and he was going to do it himself. <clears throat> so, um, but I've actually never met uh, Joe Kernan in person. I've met Carl. I've met uh, Steve Leisman, um, obviously. Um, and I've met all the guys on Fast Money. I know John and Pete real well, Nigerian. So uh, those are some big boys. Anyway, is that it? Anybody else have anything else? Oh, you saw a video of uh, Rick converting that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think he went to have somebody teach him how to switch cars. <laughs> there was a way for him to uh, get NBC to uh, or CNBC to pay for his education on how to switch natural gas, uh, switch cars to natural gas. I think it's pretty, fairly pretty easy. It's just a matter of finding somebody to fill up your tank with natural gas is the hardest thing, I suppose. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody like sticking around for so long. We, I know we went a little bit over and people probably want to get out of here and uh, get their last minute shopping in, depending on uh, everything else. And uh, uh, it was easy on the video. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's easy on the video, and it's easy when you have all the right tools. That's the thing. You start a project, and you're like, oh, my God, if I just had a rivet gun. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, that's uh, what's that bad seal issue with natural gas conversion kits. Yeah, that, that uh, does not work very well. As a matter of fact, uh, I had a... Uh, uh, anyway, proper instruction. Usually, yeah, proper instruction, and the it goes down when it's user error. So uh, I've had a uh, grill blow up on me before because I didn't let it air out enough. It was not one of those ones standalone. It was one of those built-in kind of grills, and it didn't light, and it filled up all of the the gas in the in the um, cavity below when it didn't light properly. And I went to try and light it again and saw the biggest fireball I've ever seen before coming straight at me. That was, it took a couple of years off my life. And at least I was wearing polyester pants because then they melted. Anyway, polyester sweatpants. So there's my, uh, my, bad seal issue or my user error problem. All right, let's wrap this up. Um, you know, like I said, this is being taped, so please go back and, and watch it as soon as we get done with this. Uh, it will make it sink in. And now that you, I hope I didn't confuse anybody with this little last minute error here, but uh, go back and 
watch it again because it will sink in. And this is a great strategy, especially for something like these these stocks that are pretty volatile because it allows you to sleep at night. You know, you don't have to worry about, oh my God, did I get stopped out? I, heard, I saw a trade pretty close to where my stop was. Did I get hit? Or, you know, um, on those big moves like we saw in uh, uh, August where the market just free fell. You know, you just waited two or three days. You were back in the into the money again, looking all right. So, um, you know, that's the beauty of having the puts is you can, for one, trade around them. Uh, you can't trade a stop. And two, it lets you sleep at night. You know, if the market gaps down or below where your stop is, you're, you're still, you know, sitting pretty with that core portfolio. Uh, you can either get out of it if it at expiration, it's not looking any good um, and and still sell it at that price. So it gives you a lot of choices. That's the beauty of it all. all right. Uh, thank you guys all for participating in this. Make sure you guys check out those daily market commentaries. I'm doing, uh, you know, I do it live, obviously, talk about what I'm doing. It does take us a little bit of time to convert that video and get it out to you guys. But, um, you know, I'm talking through why I, I did a particular trade and uh, how I set it up. So those are good. And uh, I don't go into as much detail as I do on these. I, I try and skim over it a little bit because it's only like a five, 10 minute video. Um, people don't like to watch, you know, hour long videos every day on me talking about it, but you know, we try and do our best on those. So check those out also. Um, that's about all I got for you guys today. If you can't take that, take it easy. Oh, and have a happy holidays, Merry Christmas, uh, and all that jazz to everybody. Thanks a lot. Have a great one.